being a founder brings out the best and worst in you, um, whether you like it or not. And if you are very much like your co-founder, it would just, you know, like increase the amplitudes on both sides of the specter. This episode is brought to you by WHU, the Otto Beisheim School of Management. WHU is reshaping the way students learn about business, management, finance, and entrepreneurship through its innovative programs and partnerships in Germany and across the globe. To learn more about this globally ranked university, visit whu.edu today. Hey folks, Garrett here. In this episode of the Most Awesome Founder Podcast, I am once again joined by my co-host, Professor Dries Fahms, for the first of a two-part series on startup pitfalls, 10 of the most common mistakes founders make when building their new ventures. The series is inspired by the Legal Ninja series, published by world-renowned law firm Oric Harrington and Sutcliffe. And joining us today, a return guest on our podcast, is our favorite legal, legal nin ninja himself, and VHU alum, Dr. Sven Groylich, partner at Oric in Dusseldorf. Coming to you from WHU, <laughs> on the banks of the Rhine River, in beautiful Fallendar, Germany, this is the best and most awesome founder podcast. A show about entrepreneurs, innovators, advisors, and educators, and the stories that make them who they are today. Welcome back, mate. Good to see you again. Hey, Gary. Good to see you. Well, Dries, I think I feel like in this conversation, since we're talking about founder pitfalls or screw ups and legal and financing pitfalls and screw ups. Um, Sven and I are kind of on, I think we're on the same team, but maybe on different sides of the table for this one, talking about the the founder perspective and the, the legal perspective. And I actually like this as I'm in a, a new founding stage right now. So I can call this uh, at least a good hour of free legal advice. So I'm looking forward to it. And I know I can't afford Sven otherwise, so I'm going to take it. <laughs> So, Dries, I'm going to pass it over to you. You are the the moderator, so why don't you uh, kick this kick this party off? Yes, so I have the honorable job to try to moderate you two guys, which uh, I'm looking forward to. And so, actually, uh, I'm, I just want to kind of go through the list that in this uh, Ninja series was was printed. Um, so, I think it was a very nice and intriguing list about uh, fuck ups that founders can do. And so, let me just jump to number one and uh, just just for the record. Yes. Yes. the one that dropped the first F bomb. <laughs> yeah. never would have had that. When he could say fuck, I can say it too, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's now officially okay. <laughs> officially approved, yes. Okay. If the professor is saying it, everybody can say Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I'm your That's student here. <laughs> <laughs> so, number one, not thinking about founder team dynamics and founder departures. Sven, why is that a big issue? with early stage startups? Yeah. I mean, Dries, is, as a good lawyer, I will answer a question, but not your question. Um, so <laughs> let, me, let me start with, with a quick uh, warning first. I mean, honestly, you and your guests, I, I do not want to depress you, okay? So I'm German, and I'm a trained lawyer, and I'm a diehard supporter of Hamburger Sportverein. And those of you who are interested in football know what that means. That is just like a hat trick of depression. <laughs> okay, um, so whatever I say, take it with a grain of salt. I only see the the dark side of um, a founder life. I mean, when you turn down a term sheet from Sequoia because you don't need money or you click so well with your co-founder that you're thinking about proposing to her, that is not when you call me. Okay, that being said, um, there are a couple of, of mistakes. So you made your disclaimer already now. I made my disclaimer. <laughs> and so I would have by now charged you for 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, but I'm already so um yeah <laughs> yeah L let me get back to where I am okay so the, let, let me come back to my favorite topic me um so you know what would um what we want to discuss today and in in the next episode is a little bit like the, the common mistakes we see many founders do over and over again and by no mistake all founders do them I mean they're super creative they come up with new mistakes all the time um but after having been around for a while pretty old by now, um, the, um, you, you see some patterns. And one of that pattern is, um, uh, is that, that founders don't think about team dynamics. 
um, enough because at the moment of when you start your startup, everything is, you know, like awesome. And it's just like every new beginning is like a dream. See, it already makes Garrett feel uneasy when lawyers talk about feelings. Um, but <laughs> the reality is um, founded teams change and there are founded team dynamics. And um, it's, it's a little bit like, like, you know, if I would have ever played American football, it's you cannot explain to someone what it feels to have someone smash into you, like this quarter morning, uh, Monday morning quarterbacking. So you don't have an idea of what being a real founder is and um, how hard it can be. And that um, people react to that. Um, and some people are just not made for that and decide that they don't want to do it. And so they depart. And it's pretty easy when you have not yet incorporated, right? Um, breaking up is never easy, but um, after um, you have been to the notary, um, and you finally, finally got your GmbH registered in Germany, it is particularly hard. Um, and it can destroy a, um, a startup. And let's not kid ourselves. I mean, I'll talk about vesting agreements in a second, but if you have a 50-50 and you break up with your co-founder and you don't settle this thing um, peacefully, amicably, no paperwork in the world will save you. It's just like, usually it's... It would just from bad money after the good money. So yeah, the other way around. Throwing the good money, we should take that out. Okay, so good money after the bad money, um, and you just make your lawyer happy. Um, but apart from these scenarios, I think it makes sense for founders to think about a vesting agreement. You don't need a lot of paperwork at the beginning. You need a solid, you know, set of articles. But you should think about um, a vesting agreement. That it's is a contract that needs to be notarized. Um, and you can do it when you set up your company. Um, and it's basically an agreement with your co-founders that say something along the lines of, if you leave the team um, within the, or if a co-founder leaves the team in the first three years of maybe four years, um, then you have to give back a certain number of your shares to the other um, Founders, and sometimes you can differentiate between, you know, whether you're particularly good lever or bad lever. Sometimes you have to get back all the shares. But basically, enable the co-founders to give your shares to someone else because they need to replace you when when you leave that startup. So, and that's something um, that unfortunately, if that needs uh, notarization, um, it is helpful, but it will only go so far, especially in a 50-50 startup with two founders. It won't help you. Maybe Garrett, when you did your first serious startup, did you have a vesting agreement with your co-founders? Yes. Um, and actually, I, I feel like we got really lucky. So, you know, I'll just add to what Ben said about vesting. You know, in the end, if you're raising venture capital, they're going to they're going to make you do that anyways. You know, um, I'm a big believer in being proactive. So what happens sometimes is the founders set up a company, they work on it for six, nine, 12 months, and then they go out and raise venture capital or, or raise angel capital. And then they say, hey, we want to vest your shares. At that point, you're 12 months in already. So what we did was we set up our founder vesting right when we established the company. And essentially, by the time we raised capital, we were only a, a few months away from the cliff. Now, of course, the the investors could have said, "Hey, we want you to, we want you to revest or or change the vesting schedule." But you're usually in a negotiation process at that point, anyway. So that gave us a little bit of leverage. So we were able to keep our our existing vesting schedule. But I, what I what I'd like to talk about this topic of team dynamics and founder departures. I'm going to leave the legal stuff to Sven because <laughs> he, I pay guys like him to give me these answers and not give them myself because uh, you know lawyers, doctors, and accountants—they're all worth outsourcing. You don't want to get that stuff wrong. But I, I, I think from the founder perspective, you know, there's some things you really need to think of early on in the process, even kind of before you get into the, the legal aspect of it. And because I've made that, I've made that mistake of having to kind of essentially fire a co-founder who also happened to be my best friend. And that was a, 
very, very unpleasant situation. Of course, he's my best friend again, but we didn't talk for a year because of that. And, you know, I take kind of two big lessons out of that early stage of, of bringing people together. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with founding a company with your mates. There's actually something really wonderful and exciting about it, as long as you're doing it the right way with the uh, with the very deliberate intentions. And and the two kind of pieces of wisdom that I've always taken away from that is one, the founder journey exacerbates whatever state that you're currently in. So if you're terribly imbalanced and stressed out and not living a healthy lifestyle, and you get into this environment where there's so much uncertainty and so much dynamicism and speed um, and sometimes stress, it tends to exacerbate that state. Um, that being said, if you're really balanced and structured and organized and healthy and disciplined, then the freedom and autonomy you get from being a founder can be great. It can allow you to, to do even more of that. But I've seen it over and over again, the people that are out of whack are become more out of whack and the people that are healthy have even more flexibility. So, you know, recognizing where you're at at that stage in your life and where your co-founders are at and being prepared for uh, what can be a grind ahead makes, makes a big difference. The other part, I think you mentioned is founder departures. And, you know, from the legal perspective, I think there's some, some mechanisms in place, but I think from the psychological perspective, there's something that we need to think about too. And you definitely see it with more experienced founders, but way less with, with the first time founders, the people that haven't done it many times before is over time, you realize where you're most effective and where you can be most dangerous and where you're not. And I'm a big believer that most founders have expiration dates. You know, we're a nice cold glass of milk at first, but at some point in this journey, we start to go sour. Um, me personally, I've learned over time that I'm really great from zero to one. But once I have 50 people and it becomes about capturing market share and not about, you know, innovation and finding product market fit, there's probably somebody better than me out there. And understanding what your skill sets are and all equally important, what you like to do and what you want to do is really, really valuable. So when I go into a new founder journey with teammates, that's something that we openly talk about right off the bat is, you know, at some point I'm going to work myself out of a job. If I do things well, there's going to be a spot three, four, five years from now where I'm going to step aside and I'm going to hire someone else that can do this next phase better than me. So you can have all the legal structures in place and they're important and in most cases they're required. But I think having that open, truthful communication with yourself and with your teammates uh, in, many in many instances can help mitigate situations when you're going to have to default to whatever the shareholder agreement has in place. Okay. So Sven, if if two guys or two girls enter your office in Dusseldorf and they have been best friends for 20 years and they come to you and say, oh, we want to found this company together, do you get nervous or <laughs> are, you, or are you okay with that? You know, new clients usually don't make me nervous. Um, <laughs> you now, the... Um, um, I, I would agree with most of what Gerd said. Um, I mean, first of all, um, I think that's um, just reiterating what Garrett um, said um, at the end of his five-minute uh, monologue. <laughs> was, um, um, that is what a good board is for. A good board will help you um, make that transition. And a good board will also have that sometimes painful um, but, but needed discussion with you. Like, look, you've been an amazing CEO and it's been a great journey from, you know, like A to B. But for the next phase, we think that we need someone else with a different skill set here. And this could be your role in the, in the, in the startup, or maybe you want to do something else. Um, but coming, coming to your question, Dries, um, there's a lot of um, value in, in having been together for some time and, and um, you know, like in a trust relationship. Um, there are 
always exceptions to rule, but I think that it is um, it pre- kind of prepares you if you've been together for a while, if you know the, you know, as, as Garrett said, the, being a founder brings out the best and worst in you, um, whether you like it or not. And if you are very much like your co-founder, it would just, you know, like increase the amplitudes on both sides of the specter, the spectrum. So um, having been together for a while and, and knowing the strength and weaknesses of the other one and how that person reacts on the stress, helpful yes i think so yes that's um why i'm not personally a big fan of just you know throwing people into a room and then hoping that you have a founded team the next day um you can set a you know set a seedling there but but um it takes it takes more time um yeah but okay. being friends for 20 years if, if you're willing to have still that awkward discussion um at, you know we're, we're talking about equity split in a second um yeah I mean, yeah, but so let's talk about that specific discussion because I think uh, equity, equity split is a is an important discussion. How do you divide the the equity among the founders? Um, I yeah. think, to be honest, if I look at my students at BAU, I have the feeling that the default option seems to be let's do it equally because we're all BAU founders. We're all these yeah, special it's, kids it's, from a school. Uh, it, it, what, it, what would be your reaction there, Sven? It's 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 this typical scenario when you have these four young, usually male, ridiculously trim and fit um, <laughs> you know, folks coming to you and say, hey, Sven, we want to do a company. Do you want to be our lawyers? I say, okay, great. Let's set up the paperwork. Where's the equity split? I said, oh, yeah, lawyer. Uh, so we are 100% of the shares and we're four. So that makes 25%. You know, I have a couple of rules how I uh, approach equity split. And, and of course, you know, like a lawyer can what's the right equity split but just from our experience it's a little bit like an even split can be a great outcome it is obviously a stable outcome arguably it is perceived as fair at least initially come back to that in a second and um, it doesn't raise questions with your investors so it can be a really good outcome and there's so many founders out there who have embarked on a on a road together and agreed on an even split and that's nothing wrong with that the, the only thing, the only point I want to make is that it is not given by to a great um, professor from my um, EMBA days. So it's not given by God, Buddha, or nature. Um, it should be the deliberate. It should be the outcome of a deliberate discussion, a very awkward discussion, but that a discussion that's needed and that you should have. Um, so you can s- start with that assumption and say, okay, let's assume we we split it um, evenly, but. There are other considerations, you know, like um, the equity split is all about maximizing future su- uh, the chances for future success. This is not personally. I don't think this is the time when you should look in the rearview mirror, okay? Right, and and, and try to um, reward past performance. I'm not arguing that you should be on un- you know act unfairly and break you know promises, but. Um, you want to maximize the chances of future success and you want to present something to your investors that is, you know, financeable. So where you think that you have the right people on board and the right people are motivated. Um, and especially the idea person needs to take a deep breath here um, where you just say like, okay, I, I had an idea. It doesn't mean that I should have the lion's share of the equity, especially okay. when I'm not jumping you know, and, and we'll we'll probably talk about university spinouts in a second, because um, that's where you know I think I could go on a rant, and I think I will go on a rant. Um, <laughs> with, you know, when when you have cap tables where the professor has fifty percent of the equity, um, something like that. Okay, so um, just a couple of of, of rules I found helpful. It's just an even split can be a fair outcome. You don't want to you know um, split up the equity by just rewarding past performance, but look at the future. If in doubt, somebody who works full time should get more. And um, again, think about your future value add to the startup and your contributions. What I what I don't believe in is like this and many more argument. Like I have published and many you know more papers. I have and more contacts. I have worked in more months. Fine or valuable arguments, but ultimately. You want to split the equity amongst people who contribute in the future um, to this. Um, and another thing is um, you can have 
too many founders. If you if you start with like you know like we are eight co-founders, and you mm -hmm. have some someone holding less than ten percent is not a founder. I mean, think about this. Um, Your, in, your cap table is a signal device. This is one of the first things that a investor will see. And it sends a signal. Like if I, if Garrett and, and I embark on a road together and on this journey together, and I have 10% and he presents this cap table um, to potential, what does it tell them about his attitude and opinion of me? Okay, so that's why he can he can present me as a key, you know, first high thing, but with 10%, I'm not a co-founder. But again, that's all, you know, only my, my personal take on this. So Garrett, what is what is your take on this? Would you fully agree or do you still have a different perspective? No, I, I honestly I think I, I totally agree with, with Sven. I, I would I think and the last point is what was really relevant to me, which is the size of the team. Right. I think if you're if you're two people and you're starting a venture together, you know, I mean, ideas are ideas mean nothing to me. Execution is is everything. So if somebody actually sparked the idea and they didn't do any work. I don't think that really provides any value. But if two people come together and say, hey, let's build this, let's solve this problem. You can't. I think you can be egalitarian and just say, "All right, we're going to split this 50-50, We're going to get diluted. We're eventually going to add more team members, but we're the two two co-founders." I think when you're starting something with four or five people, which I see so often, and now you're splitting it five ways equally, things start to get a little bit more complex, and you have more margin for error in that situation. Look, in the end, startups really should be a meritocracy. Right. Like what what do you bring to the table and, you know, who started when? Right. Like if somebody has been working on something for, you know, a year and then brings on people to, to join their team again, as Sven said, are they a co-founder? That's that's to be discussed. And if they come in and a lot of work's been done, do they do they warrant, you know, equal participation? Probably not. You know, but if the team is super small and they're coming at it together and they have equal things to contribute, then then I think it makes sense. You know, we use a lot the Veho example, right? And I, because I think we've all experienced a lot of these startups. And in that situation, it doesn't surprise me that everything's equally split because oftentimes everybody's the same, mm -hmm. right? Like there's a, there are a couple business people from a business school coming out of the same class worked on something together and how do you really divvy that up now maybe if one person throws in 100k of their own money then maybe it's a, a different discussion when you start expanding you have more diverse teams you have larger teams i think you have to you have to have some very very hard conversations and the fact of the matter is there is no easy way to have that conversation with anybody and uh but better have it better have it before things go awry sven do you actually then help people in that kind of conversation or is that outside the comfort zone of a of a legal counselor nice i mean i, I encourage um um, clients or, or even students um, who, who come to me and whom I have the pleasure to mentor um, to have that conversation and then give them just like these are things that, you know, considerations that I would suggest you discuss internally. I cannot help you with the outcome. This is your startup. This is your baby. You will have all the equity upside. I can I can only distill, of, you know, like what, what I've learned and, and give you some like um, what I found are helpful goalposts and questions you should discuss internally. And then whether you um, you want to um, stay with an even split, like we see so many times at VIA, ooh, where I find this remarkable stable. I mean, these people, maybe it's because there's nothing else you can do in Volendor. Um, <laughs> or it's just because you are spending so many, many hours after midnight in the, in the library crunching numbers um, that... People have trust, and and these these relationships tend to be stable. Um, so great there, and if it works for them, absolutely. You know, like I said, it can be a, a great outcome. It just it should be an outcome of a discussion. Um, but I would I would never dare telling people like I think you are more valuable than others. Um, where I have a stronger opinion, because I um, you know, besides Vea, who um. 
uh, we love also the um, RWTH Aachen. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in that we need more IP heavy spin outs from German universities. Um, there's so much potential there and so many good things happening and there's political momentum at the moment. Um, and this is by no means representative for RWTH, where I think that um, uh, things have developed a lot over the last couple of years. But every now and then, um, also from other technical universities in Germany, um, I get introduced to a team um, where you, you have a situation where the professor, kind of like the idea person, maybe the person brought the three PhD students together. So you also have these, you know, um, other dynamics um, uh, panning out. Um, and you have also some academic co-founders who help publish papers, fine tune an idea. And then some of the teams are really going to embark on this journey. And they may be, they may be required to also get some, some IP um, from the university. And that, um, it, that, that can become difficult when you then look at the cap table. Um, and then sometimes I see a proposal where you have the professor and I, you know, honestly, please don't send me angry emails again. I love you. <laughs> I absolutely want you to encourage your students to, to, um, to incorporate startups. Like there's an economic crisis coming. So you need to keep lawyers happy and busy, please. No, seriously, <laughs> come back. You have this, but you have a cap table where the professor expects 30% and you have um, academic co-founders who stay in academia, who don't make the leap. And I expect another 20%. I mean, Jesus. We'll talk about ESOPs um, a little, you know, a little later. But keep in mind that you need to reserve about 10% for your stock option pool, for your employees. And, and by now, it should have become clear that when you have three, four co-founders and you basically have about 50%, 60% of the equity left, and that is before you've raised a single euro. Wow. I mean, and then you're going to present this to potential investors, that will be difficult. So here, um, I think that uh, people often do not think about the long-term consequences of this initial split. And I know that the person who believes an idea and who had initially worked on an idea feels strongly about that and wants to be rewarded. But as said, the idea is worth not much without any execution, and you want to incentivize people to work really, really, really hard. But are you then the person that has to tell that difficult message to the professor? Because somebody needs to tell the person like, look, you might have been the one producing the smart idea, but 30% on the cap table is just not realistic. It will kill your startup. Look, there are probably scenarios where even a 30% equity stake might be justified um, when you're just, you know, basically landing um, transferability, uh, credibility um, uh, and, and actually add a lot of value. But just the, having an idea or say, I will, I will give you some contacts and I'll open some doors and that should justify me taking the lion's share. Um, no. I had that conversation. I think that's that's part of the um, part of the value add that that um, is expected from from a good council. That I mean, I had conversations where I asked the founders, to, you know, like on a scale from one to to ten, how honest do you want me to be? <laughs> and when they then say, none of them says one or two. They always say like ten or eleven. And then I say, yeah, let's talk about football. I mean, let's not talk about this startup anymore because I mean, with this cap table, I would rather go to McKinsey. <laughs> right, because it, it just—I I think that it, it, we had so many, so many times. Um, I had worked on, on financings where um, negotiations with the founders were done quickly, and then I had to negotiate for quite some time with um, with business angels and early investors because they diluted the founders too much. And for our clients, they were kind of "quote unquote" debt equity. Um, we had really question marks about the incentives of the founders going forward. So we had to repair a cap table, you know, down the road. And that is painful. And it only, usually it only makes the tax lawyers happy. Okay. Sorry, I want to double down on your question, Dries, to, to Sven, because I had a, the first time I raised venture capital for a startup, I had my counsel, shout out to Jochen Tans. He, 
I learned so much in that experience, but he made a point of never really giving me advice, but he would always do a wonderful job of unpacking the implications of whatever choice that it is that I make. I think a lot of times founders go to their counsel and they say, hey, I'm just going to ask my counsel what I should do. What is your take as someone that's worked with a lot of startups? Like if, if someone says, hey, tell me what to do on this, then like, do you tell them or do you say, hey, here are the implications of A, here are the implications of B, you've got to make your own choice? It is not the first um, option. Like, like I cannot say, like, do this. I mean, it, I don't know what it is, what it means to be in their shoes. I don't, you know, I have different stress, but I don't have that stress. Um, this is not my baby. I'm not vetted to that idea. I have multiple clients um, and you know, whereas for them, it is it is their life, it's their dream, it's it's what they want to do. So I'll be careful to tell them, like, this is what you should do. Um, on the other hand, I also don't think that it's um, all, only about, you know, showing them options. Because at the moment, at the you know, at that point in time, you have complexity all around you. You know, like technical complexity, complexity with your co-founders. You need to hire people, you need to find financing. The last thing you want from your lawyer is to give you also legal options. At, at that point in time, just confusing people more and then showing off with, oh, yeah, you can choose between 25 um, forms of a GmbH all across Europe, whereas, you know, that's something, no, there, there you should cut through complexity and then help them, you know, like embark on a journey where you say, like, okay, what, what you're going to do with your co-founders is you're going to get, to some extent, you're getting married. And you know that a few months or years down the road, there would be another spouse coming in. And you will now have a very complex, multidimensional um, game of chess you need to play. And then, you know, fast forward, forward, another two years, you will have another spouse coming into your marriage. And um, that is something where you can say like, okay, and, and, and ideally you all want to go now to an exit and then let's plan from there backwards. Like where we have seen uh, founder and, and investor teams fall apart and, and have, you know, hit a really bumpy road um, when it came to the exit and then say, okay, what, what led to that result? Okay. And what can I learn from that? And then, you know, coming back to, to the point in time now and say, okay, what, what can we learn from that? And um, I, but I also think it's sometimes it, it is, it is worth to, to give it straight to them and say like, look, this cap table is really, I mean, if, if you are the core, if you are the cure to cancer, it doesn't matter whether you have 50 people on your cap table pre-serious seat, right? But if you don't have the cure to cancer, probably it's not a good idea to have 50 people on your cap table, at least not when you're setting out as a German GmbH, okay. uh, where you can absolutely have too many founders, uh, sorry, too many shareholders. And I think a good counselor should, should tell you this, like same like a good business angel. Yep. Okay. Um, so we talked now already about founders and, and equity splits. Of course, as you were mentioning, after a while, you will have also employees entering your startup. And then, of course, we have to talk about participation programs. What kind of mistakes do you commonly see when startups come to you and talk about participation programs? Um, actually, I would say this um, over the last couple of years. Um, there's been a lot of um, learning in the German startup scene. Um, I think I now, I mean, not from a tax perspective and a corporate government perspective, it's still, uh, let, let, let's not talk about this. Um, so there's a reason why we have this weird concept of a work, virtual stock option plan, whereas the rest of the world, you know, does it the real way. Um, but um, from the concept perspective, I think the German founders um, have by now realized um, that they need a solid um, program, that it's super helpful, um, that it helps them align the mission and um, uh, help them, if done right, to support a good culture and help them not only win good talent, but also retain good talent. Mm. Because what you usually don't want to have is the job hopper who, who you know, like um, less let's um, the options best for 18, 24 months and then just, you know, move to the next ship um, thereby building up a portfolio that is kind of hedged whereas you have all your eggs in one basket. Um, so um, generally, I would say we, we've come down a long way here. Um, and there's also kind of now a level of standardization. And I also think there's a convergence of terms to what we um, expect to see in a quote unquote Silicon Valley style program. 
Um, so, so we have learned quite a bit while still having some particular German features that I think are super helpful. Like, you know, we're gener uh, generally more generous when it comes to paternity leave and maternity leave, and these things don't stop vesting, and that's good. That's uh, good, good German Sonderweg. Um, founders need to think about this early on, and they need to keep in mind or factor in that they will approximately need 10% um, yeah. in a if, when they rate a 10% unallocated um, option pool is a good starting point. Some investors will even ask for more. It depends a little bit how, com you know, how um, complete the founder team is already. I mean, if you have three CEO salespeople who don't have a single person who can code and you want to do a SaaS startup, then maybe 10% Visa won't. Um, but for a garden variety startup, 10% is a good starting point. But it needs to be a good program. And it, it needs to be a program that is understood and that sets the incentives right, because this program will dilute you. The investors who will come into your startup will ask you to bear the economic burden of the initial program. And then going forward, in every financing round, you usually are requested to do a top up. So you come up with, you know, seven and a half to 12 and a half percent unallocated options after a financing round. So these programs grow. And if they don't help you on the hiring side of the house, well, you still get diluted. Yeah. That's why I think it's unfortunately one of the persons um, in the founder team really, really needs to um, be in the trenches here and understands the program inside out. And when when I wake you up at two in the morning, your first question or comment should be, why the heck are you waking me up at two in the morning? And then you should be able to talk about um, the, the merits of the program okay. and explain it in a way um, that is understandable. And there's something here, like a little bit on the lawyers. These programs, and I'm, I'm absolutely guilty here, these are complex, densely printed 20 plus pages in English. I mean, you read the preamble and you want to shoot yourself in the head. <laughs> um, but uh, it, is, it is because, you know, bad cases make longer agreements. Um, so we've learned from debates or disputes with, with beneficiaries who left the company who then may sometimes suit the company. So we, you know, these programs tend to be longer. And now for, for some time we had these back transactions. And, you know, when you looked at some of the older programs, they didn't have language around these back transactions. So we added that and we just make these things complicated. But you need to distill that into something that is understandable to your beneficiaries you know, like your employees. Mm. And chances are, although I would never understand why not, they don't want to read 25 pages, you know, densely printed legally. So I think it's super helpful um, to also have um, some additional tools like FAQs in multiple languages. I think it's okay to have the program only in English, but if um, a large chunk of your workforce, you know, is speaks German much better. It is good. Uh, it's a good idea to have also some, um, some some German language FAQs on that and then have one of your um, individual, uh, sorry, one of your founders be able to really explain the merits and why this is a great idea and why it's worth quite a bit. And the other, um, there's so many things we could talk about like um, in a VSOC now. A couple of that I want to pick out is um, founders, especially in the early stages, should have a long-term perspective. I mean, the, probably know this, a standard investing scheme is four years. Well, chances are, well, your startup can go belly up, but chances are you won't go public these days within four years, or you won't be acquired within these four years. You know, startups tend to be, to stay private much longer these days. Um, so this, this, this vesting period can have expired and is still, you know, like long, long way down the down the road. So you need to keep people incentivized and put out, a, you know, another carrot. So think think about top ups and refreshes early on. Have that exit spreadsheet where you assume that every three years you would dole out another um, allocation and have an approach on how you want to set the strike price. Then, yes, you can do it in, in an arbitrary ad hoc way, but chances are people won't think this is very transparent or very fair. And that's something I would recommend. And the other thing is um, where founders sometimes don't, don't think deeply enough about is the program should have 
two effects. It should help you attract real great talent, but also retain that talent. Mm. And there are certain features that can help you emphasize the hiring or emphasize the re, you know, retaining element, retention element. So, for example, when you are doing you know, a deep tech startup and you, need, you know that it doesn't matter if I want to hire Garrett and he can be the smartest person on this planet, he will need some time to ramp up and to become fully value adding to my startup. And I know that. Maybe I have to teach him a special you know, uh, a coding language. Um, I want to set up my program to provide maximum incentives so that at least he stays around for the for the entire vesting period. So I think from some startups, it makes sense not to have this linear vesting where you have 25% here, but have something that Amazon did in the earlier days, like a backload vesting scheme over four years, but you vest in increments of 10, 20, 30, and 40%. Well, so I give an example to, to you know, and I said, Garrett, I mean, I might even give you a larger allocation now, but you will only reap the majority of the benefits if you really stay along, around for the entire rest of it. That makes sense. And that's something that you should think through um, with the help of a good counsel um, early on and not just download a program from the internet. Please. Okay. Because now I want to hear what Garrett thinks about this, because this seems to be something like, Sven, how you had explained, you have to really think upfront about how do we do this? What is the purpose of it? Is it mainly to hire good people or to retain good people? There is a lot of complexity. There are 25 pages of legal <laughs> uh, terminology that maybe normal people don't want to read. So, so Garrett, can, can you maybe, based on your experience, tell a bit of, about how you dealt with that as a founder faced with that kind of complexity? Yeah, I mean, I certainly relied on my counsel <laughs> to, to help me in the, the early, the first few times. Now I'm a little more competent in it where I can translate that to to prospective employees a little better. However, some things are a little bit tricky in German, you know, like some of these, some of these agreements still refer to the law and you have to kind of dig a little deeper. You know, the one that I always think of is uh, the bad lever, right? Like in a lot of vesting, vesting agreements, there'll be this bad lever clause where if someone is deemed a bad lever, the, uh, you know, the company can buy the shares back at nominal value, right? Or whatever that might be, a penny penny each or something. But what does a bad lever mean? You know, that there's a there's an interpretation to that. It's not listed usually in detail in these contracts as far as I understand, Sven. Um, you can correct oh. me if I'm wrong. If I'm... So like- Maybe there's... first for my understanding, what is a bad lever? So, and, 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 and Garrett, um, these days, there's there's usually some some language, and that that, um, but it's it's now that you've raised it. Um, so what happens is usually like these agreements provide for a vesting period where you basically say in German word is Ansparung, right? Which explains a lot about our startup ecosystem that we don't have a solid German word for this. Vesting means that I have an allocation of options, but um, I need to earn them over time by just being around and, and, and keep working. If I leave the company prior to the expiration of the vesting period, I'm, a, I'm called a lever. Um, and then the questions are what happens? Vesting stops, that's fine. Um, but what happens to my vested shares so far? Can I keep them? You know, Do I lose them? And that's usually where we have a distinction between a good lever and a bad lever. Okay. Um, and here's the reason why lawyers don't get invited to cocktail parties other than being really, really boring. Um, <laughs> we, we call a person, a beneficiary who has died, a good lever. You know, other people see that person. <laughs> a good lever is someone who basically can't do anything, you know, um, against being, being um, removed um, from, from service to the startup. So um, that person is either fired without cause or he or she just becomes incapable um, of, of working or just dies. So that's where you say like, okay, I understand this. You're a good lever. You can usually keep your, your vested shares or at least get fair market value for them. And then it's a bad lever. Bad lever is someone who's basically, you know, fired for cause. Um, and that person tends to get punished by um, forfeiting also um, the vested shares. And the standard question and I think there's where, where German programs have developed and, and converged to what I would see as a standard in the United States is 
what happens if I just leave the company? You know, I have no good reason. I, I started to work with Garrett and for him two years ago. And now I decide, now, actually, Jesus Christ, I can't take this guy any longer. And I always wanted to go to Australia before I become really, really old. So I now go on a, you know, on a trip to Australia. There's no, there's no reason um, for me, like, um, or Garrett can't fire me for cause. I just have a different plan. But my vesting period hasn't yet expired, and I'm a voluntary leaver. So the question is, like, what do we do with me? And that's where the program also reflects a little bit on your culture. We used to always say in Germany a couple of years ago, like, this is, this is a bad leaver, someone who leaves me before having kept his or her implicit promise to stay around for the vesting period is a bad leaver. These days, I don't see that, you know, that this is, as the, I never saw it as a, as a right approach. And um, it, it is not, certainly not what, what Silicon Valley or the US does. Um, these days, it's huge uh, in many programs is when you have left and when you leave the company and you're out of the 12 months clip period, you can, you can keep whatever, whatever the hack you have vested. And that is where, for example, the backloaded vesting comes in handy. Because it hurts me less if I have 30 and 40 percent vest only in year three or four if somebody decides to be a voluntary leaver in year two. See, but we shouldn't we shouldn't punish people for just making, um, uh, you know, a move and a decision in their life. Sometimes we see something in, a, in that straddling between a good leaver and bad leaver. That's gray leaver provisions where we, you know, somebody who has left voluntarily is not treated as a good leaver, but not as a bad leaver. So can keep 80 percent of the vest of shares or whatever so um yeah um short short question Dries. long monologue from the law <laughs> long monologue well but that's so short the complexity you know? so yeah i mean i mean we've, probably, the, we've, we've lost half of our audience over the last three or four <laughs> minutes but that's okay we'll try, and, we'll try and bring it back but i mean i think this is the this is the point that i i wanted to make a little bit like i think for so long you know Startups and founders set up vesting schedules, set up vesting programs and ESOPs as a as an incentive to recruit talent where they couldn't afford to pay market market value for somebody's wages. But and I'm a big believer in these programs. However, over time, everybody offers them, and they almost all offer them on the same terms, right? So you backload it. I don't know if that's actually gonna help help you recruit or not that may be beneficial to the company but it may not be beneficial to getting the top talent when there's another company down the road that that's not doing it in that structure in the end and i think what we've seen over time is the the mercenary mentality with startup employees you know it, i don't think the vesting sched, the vesting and the esop are really the big incentive, at least for many, many employees. You kind of, it's kind of something you have to do, but it's not really going to move the needle. I think, look, Sven used the example of curing cancer, right? If you're a startup that's curing cancer, you're going to keep people around, right? Because they're seeing the trajectory of the business and they're seeing the opportunity. If you're building a, an app in a competitive space, it, it doesn't matter. You know, I don't like you got to have it. It's there, but it's really not going to move the needle. I think what becomes more important is, are you providing interesting engineering challenges for your software team? Do you have a great culture at, where people want to work and they're enjoying themselves? Do they have autonomy and flexibility and, and those types of things? And in the end, those things tend to be more important than the details of, of the, the ESOPs. Yes, you have to have them. But no, I don't believe that they're very central to building great teams anymore. I think so much more is, is this a kick-ass business that's going places? And is it a great place to work? That's going to come first. And if those two things are happening and the company's growing, those, those employees are eventually going to make more money. They're eventually going to grow. The ESOP will be an awesome bonus in the end if it works. But again, an ESOP only has value if the company exits. And that's the big problem is employees join a company as soon as they see it's not going down that path. It doesn't matter if they're vested or not. They'll jump ship right after 12 months because they don't see a future for the company. So I think you just can't put all of your eggs in that basket. Sven, because what I hear here is like, okay, a legal framework is important and you should not screw it up. But today, 
the legal sophistication of your ESOP or whatever, it will not move the needle. It's just a kind of necessary condition, but it, it will not differentiate you. Can you live with that as a lawyer or would you disagree with that? No, I mean, ideally, you never look into this agreement after the allocation. Okay. But I think um, there, there are a couple of, of um, uh, uh, levers that, that, that you can pull um, as a founder and where I would respectfully um, and yet disagree with Garrett, um, <laughs> where I think it is, it is, it is helpful um, for you to set um, the tone and also send a signal how you want to treat employees, even like see above uh, the voluntary lever. I mean, personally, I don't think it should be a bad lever if, if, if he or she is out of the, of the cliff period and it just sets a wrong signal that you want to tie people to you rather than tying them to the mission. But it is something you should have, you should have and you should communicate it well. Um, and but, but Sven, is it maybe that even the, the participation program is a more important signal to investors than to the employees? No. That you, that you actually sure. signal with the participation program, look, investors, we take our employees seriously and we want to treat them professionally and that maybe the employees don't care too much about it. I wouldn't say, no. I mean, first, a couple of things again here. Is, um, do I believe in the value of this program? Or is it just a nice bonus for me? That also ties to the question that I, I get asked a lot, like to give options to all my employees, or mm. should I focus on certain key employees but give them more? Um, and then it is um, it, it is a re um, it is a reward there. That I think a remuneration element that I think you need. And there are cases when you look at. I mean, like I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a sick mind, so I sometimes read IPO prospectuses. And for example, <laughs> if I remember this correctly, um, the, the IPO prospectus from, um, uh, from, from Auto Eins, when they went public, um, they paid out a lot of money to um, visa beneficiaries. And mm -hmm. these stories travel. When you go to, to, um, to, the, to the West Coast, everybody knows the story about this Google masseuse, you know, like Bonnie Brown. I think it was her name, employee number 41 or 42, um, who was hired by Google um, in the late 1990s and got a couple of options and which netted her a couple of millions when Google went public a little later, two years later. So um, it travels, it builds a narrative. Um, and uh, if you don't spread them too thin, people will believe in the value. Um, of these and and um, yes, money is an imperfect incentive, but it is a strong incentive. And of course, I mean your investors will usually expect it from you. Yes, in the financing round. Okay, good. Uh, maybe one final issue that I briefly want to discuss with you is about um, should you invest as a person or should you have your holding entities? And uh, we do, of course, some research on the BAU ecosystem and then we indeed see a lot of holding entities emerging if you go a bit into the shareholder structure so uh, we are quite fascinated by that um so sven why why would you need to have a holding entity to do this i mean at, at, at vau i would i would probably not even mention that in my classes anymore <laughs> people would say like oh god grandpa is talking about the old times again oh my god now he will mention his nokia phone um, yeah. So, as you would be surprised um, uh, at other places that that um, this this founder holding um, concept is still um, uh, sometimes unknown or not understood well. So, I'm talking now about um, the founders who are looking to realize the value of their startups by by pursuing an exit. So, if you're playing a long-term dividend game, this is probably not for you. But if you are the quote-unquote typical um, startup looking for um, venture capital investors whom you know at some point will want to exit um, and and realize the value of their shares in your company, um, that that is, and you are German tax resident, is it is very helpful not to hold um, your shares um, in your startup directly, but to set up usually an UG. Unternehmergesellschaft Haftungsbeschränkt um, gives you a lot of points at Scrabble. Um, the and and um, have 100% in that founder holding entity, and then let the founder holding entity um, hold your shares in the startup. Let me give you an example why this is helpful. 
basically there are two reasons. Number one, it preserves flexibility if you are in the category that at some point you want to do a flip and um, move into a Delaware um, holding structure, a US holding structure. For some deep tech companies and for companies who are in a space where it is easier to um, attract financing in the US, this might become helpful. But the way more important reason is um, it saves you money, a lot of money. Quick example, um, Garrett and I do a startup. Garrett has, you know, Read the Ninja series. He has set up the startup um, uh, in, in, a, in the right way and holds the shares in the startup both at 50% through a founder holding entity, which he holds 100%. I hold the shares myself. So the cap table is the Garrett founder holding entity 50% and Sven personally 50%. We don't need investors. We don't believe in venture capital. We bootstrap everything. We work really, really hard and we have an amazing exit. So what happens? On my personal bank account, money pops up. You know, I can I can spend it on a fancy car, buy a house, whatever. Um, I pay 28.5% um, in taxes um, and church tax might come on top. What happens on Garrett's personal bank account? Nothing. Because mm -hmm. the money is sitting in his founder holding entity. But that um, effective tax rate is, long story short, 1.5%. Mm. And if we have more time today, I could demonstrate to you that 28% is more than 1.5%. Um, and Garrett has the money basically, um, you know, like, um, as we would say in German, Brutto für Netto, um, available um, for his next venture. Um, if he wants to spend it for you know, his personal affairs and, and buy himself a car, he would need to do a dividend and that will neutralize the tax effect, but he can control that point in time. And until then, he can let the money work in his founder holding agreement. So as a rule of thumb, if you are the prototypical startup looking for investors and to exit at some point, um, rule of thumb is do not hold the shares yourself. Hold it through a founder holding entity. If you have just embarked on your journey, you might still be able to fix that without a tax mayhem. Mm. Then I want to ask you a little nuance of this because it was something that I, I uh, came across with one of my portfolio founders recently and that they were uh, utilizing an UGE that they had already set up and were using as like a freelancer or a contract to contract and do contract work out of. So they were they were actually earning revenue through that entity and then were going to hold their shares. Now, Looking at their looking at their agreement, there was a clause in there about insolvency that could have caused them problems with their their shares in the company. Is there anything, any advice about keep like setting up a unique new separate entity just for the shares of that company, or if you already have an existing UGE that you're transacting out of to use that? Yeah, there um, there are certain. Scenarios where it may be helpful to have a mutual holding UGE. Um, there's, but the general rule would be, and my advice would be, set up for each founder a separate and fresh UGE. I mean, it doesn't cost you a lot of money. It, it is, it is, you know, cheap in Germany. It's a couple of hundred euros, um, and it just makes, you know, departing um, later so much easy, so much easier. Um, and also when you present this to the to the investors, like, look, we have this joint UG. There was not really a good reason to do this. We just wanted to save 500 euros. But now we have the issue that and one of us leaves and the other stays on board. Um, we just basically move this problem one level up because we have this mutual holding entity. Or I have also kind of, you know, many sidekicks going on in this, this UG, which might ultimately have ripple effects on my startup. And that's something where investors would say, just like, nah, just, you know, give me something that's plain and vanilla. Gotcha. Okay, then I think actually we discussed like the most important screw ups from a kind of human legal perspective. So I want to end the discussion here. So Sven, thanks for all sharing your kind of in-depth insights here. And Garrett, thanks for bringing kind of the founder touch. And I think we will see each other uh, next time again. So then we will take a deep dive more into the financing issues. So I'm really looking forward to that discussion. Thanks for having me. See you on the next one. Bye.